Hello, and welcome to episode uh, 141 of the Casual Try Hard Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm James. This week, we're going to do some odds and ends from the playing and paper, like learn to play series, sideboarding, net decking, that kind of stuff. And yep. then we might talk a little bit about um, Midnight Hunt Limited. Yeah, we'll see. We talked about it in the pre-show. So if we don't get to it in this episode, make sure you check the pre-show out. It has all of our thoughts about it. We'll try and get there, but we uh running a little late on time this week. So let's see how far we get. Yeah. All right. So um, if you want to tweet at us things you want to hear us talk about going forward, you can get at us at Casual Tripod on Twitter. Yep. Or you can hit us up on Facebook at Casual Tryhard MTG. Or you can send us an email, show at casualtryhardmtg.com. Um, we also have our Discord. There's a link in the description. There's a link on all our social media. Any of those places are a great way to get a hold of us. Let us know your thoughts about Midnight Hunt or what sweet standard decks you're playing or what kind of events are firing at your local game store. Um, it was a question I asked last week. I did have one person in Discord chime in. So thank you. You know who you are uh, to let me know how things are at their LGS. Um, we kind of went on a rant and we had some decent feedback about our rant last week. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, what's going on at your local LGSs and, you know, what the communities are like and how people are adapting to this new modern way of magic. So hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, email, Discord. Let us know. Uh, as Brian mentioned, you can also... Ask us questions, uh, give us ideas for shows. We are here to serve you guys. So hit us up, let us know. Um, next week, I think we are going to do a kind of financy episode. Uh, talk about the new set, some cards we're ordering, maybe a little bit of our general like thought process when we make orders for cards. Um, and I know I will be doing that using our TCG player affiliate link, uh, tcg.casualtryhardmtg.com. Anything you purchase after following that link, we'll get a cut of to help keep the show going, pay for hosting fees and whatever else we got going on. Um, so make sure you use that link. And if you want to support us a little bit more directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash casualtryhardmtg. Uh, like I said, patrons get access to our pre-show. Uh, normally, it's about an hour long, just kind of us catching up. You don't get to see each other as much anymore. Like I said, not a whole lot of stuff happens at our local game store. So before we record, that's our chance to catch up. Um, it's a lot less formal than the actual show is. A, a lot more story time and you know talking about stuff that's not magic. But there's always magic stuff in there too. So if you want access to that, hop on over to patreon.com slash casual tryhard MTG throw a couple bucks in the pot and you get to listen to that. Um, you'll get added to my list when I do Patreon givebacks and you also get access to our show notes. So you kind of get a sneak peek of what's coming up that week. And last but not least, we have our YouTube channel. Uh, Brian has been kind enough to record most of his limited games for midnight hunt. Uh, yeah. There's some good stuff in there, so make sure you head over there and check those out as well. I th think there are 11 drafts up there out of the, like, 17 that I've done. Nice. Or 19 or something, so most of them are up there. Yeah. There's been a, a few iPod, iPad drafts, uh, iPod drafts, your drafts <laughs> with the click wheel. It'd be great. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> how many kids don't even know what the click wheel is anymore? I know, I that know. That was, what, like 2003? So I have a good story. So when I had a like 80 gig iPod that had the click wheel and it was when mm -hmm. the iPod touches had just come out. Yeah. And and the and they had the iPhones had, had recently come out, but I was still yeah. using like a crappy flip phone and I had my iPod sitting on the uh on the table in front of my class and someone came up and was like, "What is that?" I'm like, "It's an iPod." Like, "Can I touch it?" And she was like, "It won't work." <laughs> and I was like, it's not a touch screen. So I had to like click on it. And this was in like 2010. And it was like they were dealing with like an archaeological find. And it's it the like, Antikythera mechanism. Yeah. I was just like, no, no, no. There's no, only no, rumors of how it used to operate. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. Here, let me. It, it's fine. But um, yeah. So I have most of them recorded. Um, 
I think they are pretty representative of the format. And yeah. I so on Tuesday, I think it's draft eight. One of the best games of limited I've ever played is the last game in that uh in that uh uh video. That video? Awesome. Yeah, it it is it was very good. So I'll have to check that out. Um so I think we're going to start up on sideboarding. Yeah. Which is a rapidly dying art with our best of one overlords. Yeah. I know I know I said I wanted to keep this episode short, but I think I have to talk about one more thing before we jump into this. Okay. And that is kind of like me coming to grips with how magic is changing. Okay. So it's a little bit tied into last episode. It's a little bit a little bit of what we're gonna talk about next week, but because you said that, you set me off. <laughs> oh no. Wound um, him up. <laughs> not really wound up, but it's just I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around how like the game that I've spent so much time playing is becoming something completely different than what I used to play. And part of that is all the stuff that we talked about last week. Like you said, sideboarding becoming a dying art. Like I mean, if there's no paper events firing and limited ranked is mostly the premier drafts, which are best of one, like draft really doesn't happen on magic online. Most of the, most of a sets draft is on arena, like in not just for limited, but even, you know, when you're playing on the ladder or whatever, you're kind of incentivized to play, you know, best of one games. Like the whole game is just changing. And I don't know. It is what it is. And I think I just have to kind of come to grips with that, that it just is what it is. And it's different now. Yeah, I do. Like when I watch like a Saffron Olive video and he like goes to sideboarding, I'm like, oh, yeah, get that. Oh, edge. yeah. Like, get That's that a edge. thing. <laughs> yeah. Like he like, you know, because he predominantly plays best of three. Yeah. And I'm just like, I should probably do that. Like, in my head, like, when I think about decks, I also, yeah. like, build the sideboard, but right. then I don't ever end up using it. I'm like, this yeah. is what I think I want, and I'll put it together, and it's like, yeah, that seems reasonable. But, yeah, yeah like, I hardly ever play best of three anymore. And, I mean, that would be a huge adjustment, like, going to, you know, an LGS and being, like, best two out of three. Yeah. I think that for me, it depends on what deck I'm playing. Like if I find a deck that really interests me, that's more aggro slanted, I, I'm more apt to just fire off a bunch of, bunch of best of one games and just, you know, try and grind a little bit that way. Yeah. Whereas like if I find a mid range deck that looks really interesting and we're going to talk about this mid range decks are very much like a 75 card deck instead of a 60 card deck and a 15 card sideboard and like mid range decks gain a lot from sideboarding. So if I'm playing, like if I find a mid range deck, I really want to play typically that will be best of three. Whereas, you know, if I'm just playing something aggro or some stupid to bolt trickery combo deck, obviously that's just best of one. Yeah. Which like, I've not played best of one historic, I've not played Historic Period since uh, Modern Horizons, Legendary, Mythic, Boogaloo. Jumpstart. Yeah, Jumpstart. Yeah. I, I have not played Historic at all Yeah. since then. I was, I'm like, I'm like, I kind of think you lost me. Well, like, you get to play 8 Delver now. Yeah, 8 Delver. I mean, I'm like, like thinking about like, oh man, it'll be fun to like, when they do like the... The next like artisan event, because mm-hmm. uh, because I lost my like my old artisan deck, it went away. Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, oh, I can just play Dilver. Yeah. Like that'll be fun. Dilvers like, and considers and ops. Yeah, like his yeah his like oh like historic uh, artisan just like it's just Dilvers and ops and uh, yeah. dragon race chandlers and unholy heats like that'll be fun. All right, so sideboarding. Sideboarding. So you 
sideboarding basically is you've got those 15 cards in your sideboard and after game one and after game two you mm-hmm. can bring cards from your sideboard into your deck typically yep. you're going to take cards out of your deck and put them into your sideboard but you want to end you up don't have to you don't have to but typically right. you want to end up presenting 60 cards again yep. but 60 cards that are now better tuned to play mm-hmm. against your opponent's style of deck and yep. this is important what you think their deck is going to be like after they sideboard yeah that that is a biggie um it's kind of a like a mind game that you have to play with your opponent if this is something that you do with sideboarding is you can either speed up or slow down your deck in relation to what your opponent's doing Typically, when you slow down, you're going to go a little bit bigger, whereas if you speed up, you're going to go a little bit smaller. So if you're like playing a mirror match and you're on the draw, a lot of times you want to slow down a little bit, go a little bit bigger than your opponent. Um, so you're going to take you know some number of cards out of your deck, some of the smaller stuff, and maybe put some bigger stuff in, ways to go over the top. Um, or vice versa. If you're on the play, you want to try and go underneath, so you're going to you know, bring some smaller stuff in, maybe some different interaction, less expensive interaction, things like that. Um, One thing that is a little bit different now than when we first covered this, the first time we did our playing and paper series is sideboards. Aren't just sideboards anymore. They are not. So when you're building your sideboard, and like this really isn't something I've had to describe, so you guys are going to have to bear with me for a minute. Um, you have to determine how valuable the the room in your sideboard is to you for actual sideboard, because you have all sorts of other ways you can spend those sideboard slots now, like having a companion or with lessons. So with with lessons and to a lesser extent companions you're almost almost every sideboard is built like a wish board yeah where decks that have wishes right spells that like let you take a card from your sideboard and put it into your hand mm-hmm. right they they always balance this fine line of how many wish targets do i need right Versus how many things do I need to have access to to change my deck in between games? Yeah. And it used to be that, like, in Standard, that came up mm, once every two years. Maybe yeah. maybe more that there was a playable wish right, and a deck that was good enough that you had to worry about building a sideboard for your wishes. So probably Mastermind's Acquisition. Yeah. And then... Was that Ixalan? That was like Ixalan or Hour. Yeah. Right, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Hour. And then... Vast... Then that was not an issue for a long time. Um... And then you had, uh, oh, what is it called? Fay of Wishes. Fay of Wishes. So then we had to worry about it for like when Fay of Wishes was good. Fay of Wishes hasn't been good for a bit, right? Because they had to like nerf all the stuff that made, uh, well, the combination of like Gold Span Dragon and like nerfing uh, uh, Adventure. You're yeah, right. Right. So, but like you had to worry about it then. But now you're going to have, like, another year of... And then companions were there. Then you're going to have another yep. year of, all right, I want to play a ramp spell. I want to play field trip. Mm-hmm. All right. How many things do I need my field trip to be able to go get? Right? Yep. And it's usually like, well, I want to have a removal spell. I want to have environmental sciences so I can hit my next land drop. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess I should just have mascot exhibition. Right. Right? Can't and leave then, home without it. Yeah, and you get up to like when you get up to like five, six, seven cards. Right now, the cards to change your deck are really like whittled down. Yeah. You have to be like, do I, 
Like, do I need to have an answer for everything that I can get with my uh, uh, learn card? Mm-hmm. Or do I want to have regular cards? Right. And that is that is an interesting balance that we've not had to deal with before. Yeah, it very much it seems like the correct answer is you want two of anything that's remotely playable. Um, right now, like the I, the black decks, the black, red, and seven decks or whatever, um, all play eye twitch just because it's something you can sacrifice to, you know, draw some cards, you can trade it off early, and it replaces itself. And I think almost every list I've seen is like, two of the naturalize and then one of the uh, exile something and then two environmental sciences and like two mascot exhibitions. So it's like seven cards you're playing. It's like half your sideboard. Yeah. And then you've got what's left. And I mean, it makes sense, right? Like any card that like most cards that say draw a card on them, are good yeah. enough yeah this is a one mana card that says draw a card on it but it says go pick a card that you want right as opposed draw to a specific card yeah go draw a spell yeah and it's like oh that's really good like i don't just yeah. have to rip a random card off the top of my deck no no you get to go pick do you have right. seven mana go put three creatures into play yeah are you afraid of missing your land drop go get your land drop Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, this is this is much better than just maybe randomly drawing the seven mana spell when I only need the when I need my land drop. Yeah, right. So, yeah. We that also, is- uh, I know not many people are playing it, but just to keep in the back of your mind, we also have wish. Oh yeah, we do have wish. Yep. Just go get a thing now Ca- and cast they- it this turn. Yeah. 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 Um. Like part of this overlaps with actual sideboarding, though, specifically in the lessons case, because like most green decks are going to play some sort of naturalized effect in the sideboard anyway, whether it's, you know, naturalized or reclamation sage or whatever it is, some way to deal with enchantments and artifacts. And like for that also to be double duty as um, a learn target is. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I want this anyway. I can have access to it in game one. Yeah. And also, right, if you're playing four field trips, Mm -hmm. you have access, you have four copies of that lesson in your deck as opposed to just like the two you would normally bring in and hope to draw. Correct. So you're actually... You actually have more access to it than you would otherwise, not counting any other uh, learn cards you might have. Yeah, really so, changes sideboarding. I, it does. I guess I, when I was writing this episode, I really didn't like even think about how much it's different now than it used to be. Yeah. So, right the the goal of sideboarding, you know, taking like for older formats learn lesson isn't good enough right yeah you're not you're not willing to spend the extra mana for it yeah so like in the older formats where sideboard becomes really important right it allows you to like play hate cards if you if you need to play hate cards for a certain deck so Mm -hmm. sometimes right if dredge was good in modern which is a graveyard deck there you had rest in peace and that was a card they couldn't beat. Yeah. If, or if like Graf Digger's Cage or Graf whatever. Digger's Cage, yeah. Or if your if Affinity was really good, they play people would play Stony Silence. And then Affinity yep. wasn't good anymore. Right. And so then you they have, banned it. <laughs> yes. Then they banned all the good cards. So you have the cards that are like the silver bullet if I resolve this card, my opponent can't beat it until they get it off the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Right. But then you have the cards that are kind of doing double duty, or we talked about this cards that can fill multiple roles. Yeah. So a card like 
a braid. Mm -hmm. Right? Where it's like, um, kill a creature or an artifact. Yep. So it took the kill an artifact. So if you were just playing Shatter, right? You had to you had to also play a kill uh, a creature removal spell, mm -hmm. right? A braid let you let your shatter slot also be your kill a creature slot. Yeah, you so, can bring it in against the aggro decks and against you know whatever troublesome artifacts you had. Right. So instead of having one shatter and one creature removal spell, you put two of two of braids in your deck, and now you have two shatters and two removal spells but they're only taking up two slots instead of four mm -hmm. so like that was something we talked about like just making sure that you pick the most flexible things yeah so that you can kind of cover all of your bases right as opposed to just being like well i want shatter so like cards like uh what is it return to nature mm -hmm. right that's destroy an artifact or destroy an enchantment, or exile a card from a graveyard. Yeah. Right? It's your graveyard heart hate card in green. It's your enchantment hate card, and it's your artifact hate card. One card is covering all three things. Yeah. Different matchups, different circumstances yeah. where you might want it. And maybe you only were, maybe you were like, I want to naturalize. I want to destroy target enchantment. Well, you don't just play Destroy Target Enchantment. You're like, oh, no, I would much rather have this that does all of this other stuff. And maybe you weren't planning against playing against Reanimator, mm -hmm. right? But, you know. Uh, Here it is. Yeah, Return to Nature is good against modern Reanimator because the yeah. deck is slow enough that it can't just, like, turn to you. Like, you have yeah. time to be like, all right, pay your two mana to, like, uh, what is it? Unmarked grave, your creature. All right, pay your two mana to persist it. Cool, I will remove it now. Yeah. Right? And like that card wasn't there for that matchup, but because it had the extra text, right. it works out. So you want to use your cyborg to cover as many matchups as possible. And it works out that the way they keep printing modern cards, <laughs> they. It's just walls of text with everything on them. Yeah, they keep giving you ways, and it's like, well, I used to have to have a graveyard to hate slot, and an enchantment slot, and an artifact slot. It's like, no, no, this one card does this, so I can put yeah. three of this card in, it covers all three of these, so now I have three times as much hate for each thing. Yeah. So, like, just being mindful of, like, this is what I need to to deal with. So, have you ever watched a, a Magic AIDS video? Yeah. So I think one thing, like you know, his commentary is a little a little out there sometimes. <laughs> but and we'll take two of this out and put two of this in, and on we go to the next game. Yeah, but when he does his deck breakdown, right? When he does his deck tech, yeah, the sideboard is always the same thing, and I think it's informative. It's always he goes like creature hate, graveyard hate, counter hate, control hate, like. He has in his head, very specifically, these are the things that this deck is weak to. My deck is weak to these things. Yeah. So I specifically have cards in my sideboard to deal with those things. Yeah, it, that's actually a really good point. And like, I guess I hadn't really picked up that that's exactly what he was doing, even though it's obvious that that's what he's doing. But your sideboard is really no good to you without a plan on how to use it. And I think that's where you're going with this. Yeah. So he has, he always has like the, the plan of these are what these cards are for. And then I think what comes a lot across less clearly, cause it's always take out this and put in this and go on to the next, go on to the next yeah. one. Right. But yeah. it's always, I think that when he makes his sideboard, he's like, okay, if I play against the graveyard deck, these are the three cards that come in, and I know what three cards need to come out. Yeah. Right? And that's the other thing. You can have the best answers in your sideboard, but if you haven't sat down and thought about what are the cards that need to come out. Yeah. To, like, A lot of times that's work. just as important, too. Yeah. 
So, you know, it can be things like, so there's certain things that you can take out, right? So let's say you're playing against an opponent that has the spell Lava Dart or mm -hmm. Play With Fire is a, is a more uh, modern example yeah. that deals two damage to creatures, right? Or Lava Dart deals one damage. Mm -hmm. If you're playing against an opponent that has Lava Darts, if you can, you probably want to remove all of your, or as many one toughness creatures out of your deck as you can. Yeah. Right. So you don't like let them get paid off as like hard as possible. Right. Yeah. Right. You don't want to play a bunch of like three mana, uh, three ones. Yeah. And then just like one mana kill it. Right. You, you... well, that was like, uh, when Goblin Chain Whirler was legal. Yes. You just if weren't you were allowed to play against a, yeah, if you were playing against a Chain Whirler deck, you took out all of your Glint Sleeve Siphoners because they just died. Yeah, and I mean, you played so many Goblin Chain Whirlers, you might not even put them in your deck to begin with. Yeah. Right, but... Well, I mean, the decks that played Chain Whirler also played Glint Sleeve Siphoner. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, oh, the Mirror, these have to go. Yeah. Right? So you want to, like, first... I think the easiest cards to take out are the cards that, like... Either your opponent, for whatever reason, is like kind of pre boarded, or like their deck is good against them incidentally. So, like we said, like they play a bunch of one damage spells, and you have a bunch of one toughness creatures. You probably want to shave on those to make yeah. those one damage spells worse, mm -hmm. right? They're a super aggressive deck, and you have a bunch of like seven drops. Yeah, well, you're probably, probably not wanna... going to get around to casting them. Yeah, you probably need to, sh to shave your seven drops, right? Or, I don't know, you're playing, like, for some reason, you're playing some walls, right? Mm -hmm. And they're a control deck that has no creatures. Right. Right? You're like, well, maybe these walls aren't where I want to be. I need something that has power and power that can attack to put them under yeah. a clock. So I mean, wanna... same goes for removal, though. Like, you're not going to play, you know, targeted creature removal or wraths against a control deck. Fair. Or, like, but this is where, like, you're, like, the the mind game, right? Because yeah. we all know, like, that control decks will, in game two, bring in a bunch of, like, Lyra Lyra Dawnbringers. Yeah. Or, right, they'll bring in big angels or they're like, well, they're not going to have any creature removal. So I'm going to try to, like, surprise them with some either value creatures that are going to accrue advantage, advantage if they stay on the battlefield. Yeah. Or, you Something know, just, that just closes the game. Yeah. Or just some big dumb flyer that, like, has lifelink. I'm just like, well, I can't ever beat that. Right. Because you could definitely see, like, if there's a blue, white or blue, black control deck in standard. Right. Mm -hmm. Game one, they're creatureless. They're beating you with, I don't know, some, like, pile of sadness, a hall of the storm giant. Right. That's their wing right. con. It's like, this land, let's go, right? And then in game two, they board in four poppet stitchers. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you're like, well, I can't cut all of my removal because if they stick a poppet stitcher, yeah. then it's I'm in trouble, over. right? But I can't have as much removal because if they don't bring in their poppet stitcher, or I can't have as much removal because it's dead. So you've got this right. like fine line to, to to walk. So identify the things that are dead, but also mm -hmm. realize that your opponent is not a goldfish and is doing the same thing. Yeah, they're making right. changes as well. They're making changes as well. So you have to be like, oh, I know the control decks always bring in poppet stitchers, so I can't cut all of my removal, but maybe I'll keep, maybe I'll cut my only creature removal and keep my creature and planeswalker removal in. Yeah, they don't. Oh, good. I was just going to say that that's where it's important to be flexible. Yeah. Like may maybe if that's a deck you're planning on going against, instead of having, and I don't even know what a great example is right now, but instead of having, you know, just a removal spell, like instead of having a. Um, Infernal Grasp? A, yeah. You have, you know, a Planeswalker that can get you value, but also kill a thing. Yeah. Like, just giving your... Like, you could have... I guess Arlen doesn't kill a thing. But, yeah. whatever. Yeah, I was trying to think of a Planeswalker that killed things, and I couldn't off the top of my head. Yeah, I know. They don't have as many of those now. Yeah. Uh, but, like, just 
giving yourself the flexibility and realizing like, okay, this is what's going to change. So yeah. if you guys remember way back when there were paper events, this was like almost two, this was two years ago. Oh, Oof. right. When we yeah. were going to that legacy event, right. Mm-hmm. The, the thing, one of the things that we did is we actually printed out a sheet mm-hmm. with like, I think we had 15 different matchups. Yep. And what cards we had thought about wanting to take out against that matchup and what mm-hmm. cards we wanted to bring in. Now, oh, the sideboard guide. Yeah. Well, we, we couldn't play every matchup. So some of it was uh, theory crafting and like, okay, what do I think will be good? What are the things that matter in this matchup? Yeah. But where we could, we like played the matchups mm-hmm. and like, okay, let's play this pre board. What? what feels like it matters and what do we want to have post board right and like one of the cards we settled on was lily of the last hope yeah right because lily was something that you could play against a deck like miracles Mm -hmm. that if it stuck and it ultimated you got to win the game basically yeah there's no way they can stop that right but also, along the way, you could, like, down tick for value and get stuff back. Mm-hmm. And it also was good against um, uh, Death and Taxes, oh, the yeah, worst matchup for Deaths. Yeah, because it killed all their their X1s. So yeah. it was like, oh, hey, this is a card. It was like, we want a card for Miracles. We want a card for Death and Taxes. This can do both. Mm-hmm. Right. So we went through and was like, okay, if we're playing death and taxes, these are the cards that are no good. These are the cards that are good. Right. And we would like sit down and like actually like struggle over like, okay, I really want the second copy of this from the sideboard in against miracles. But what is the thing that we have to cut? Yeah. Right. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? What is my, what do I want my role in this game to be post board? Yeah. Right. And so that is a thing to to think about. Like if you have the time and like it super matters to you, right? Even if you're like on the ladder, right? Mm -hmm. Like to think about like, all right, when I play against blue red dragons, I'm gonna bring in four soul shatters. Okay. What has to come out? What are the things that are bad against dragons? Or what are the things that I can like I'm willing to sacrifice, like, I'm going to become, I'm going to go from being the black aggressive deck to a more controlling deck. So I'm going to bring in something black can definitely do. So I'm going to bring in soul shatters and I'm going to bring in blood on the snows and and discard spells, discard spells and uh, lulf, right? Yep. So I have this package of like 10 things I'm bringing in. So I'm going to cut some one drops. Yep. Right. Or, you know, I can keep I Twitch because it gets me value, but I'll cut these other cards, right? So yep. it's like I'm not a creature deck anymore. I'm like a Lolf control deck, yep. and you can do that. It takes a lot of sideboard slots, but like if that's how you think that you're gonna like win the game, right? You're like okay, like Soul Shatters, like four Soul Shatters, three Blood on the Snows, two Lolfs. Mm-hmm. This is my plan, and everything else around this will just like make work. Yeah, and right. that's where it's important to have a plan, too, because then, like you said, you can kind of manipulate the cards that are in those slots to be good in multiple matchups also. Yeah, and also you don't want to be, you know, in between game one and game two and being like, oh, I've never thought about this matchup. Yeah. What am I going to do? Now, there's so, definitely times that you you're playing against a deck that you're like, oh. I've never thought about this matchup, <laughs> right? I've never seen this deck before. And you kind of lean, you have to like fall back on like their aggro. I can go bigger than them. I certainly so wasn't expecting do. to sit down and play against seismic swans today. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I guess fateful absence is probably good against the swan. <laughs> I should probably cut my lightning bolts against the swan. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, one more thing to add okay, is uh, not really add, just kind of make an observation is we're talking about like sideboard guides and how yes. 
you know, you're having like a plan for each matchup. Um, I would love to be able to point you guys in a direction of a sideboard guide so you can like look at one and, you know, kind of see what information is there and how they're set up. However, they're all behind paywalls now. Oh, oh. Like that used to be a thing where you could like look up a deck and say, oh yeah, this is, this is the sideboard guide for this deck. Like somebody recommended this for a tournament and it came with a sideboard guide and here I am. But now if you like the deck list is, you know, public knowledge, anybody can look up the deck list, but that, uh, that sideboard guide, you got to subscribe to coolstuffinc.com or you got to you know, become a patron of some content creator, or donate to their only fans or whatever. Yeah. Where, where instead of, instead of spicy pictures, it's just pictures of sideboarding guides. Yeah. Like for $5, you get to see what you do in the, in the, is it dragons matchup? Oh, hey, hey man. Only, only fans is a legitimate business. It's not, it's not just for spicy pictures. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. We're going to ban spicy pictures. Oops, our bad. I guess we don't have a website if we do that. <laughs> spicy pictures are back on the menu. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you, there was a college humor thing where they uh, one of the guys pretends to be the CEO of random companies. Yeah. And he pretended to be the CEO of, of uh, OnlyFans. And it was like, what percentage of our uh, website is, we'll, we'll say spicy pictures, and they were like nine, nine per T, 95, <laughs> 95%. Why did we do this? But, but yeah, I, what I was going to say was, uh, I do believe somewhere in the uh, deep recesses of our Google Doc. Our Google Doc supply. Oh yeah, it's probably ha- still there. We have a sideboarding guide for a couple of decks, I think, yeah, living there, right? Probably. We we definitely. I'm pretty sure we have Green Black Depths and Legacy. We have um um what's it called? I we probably have some of our standard decks from like early Ixalan standard. Yeah, maybe not I'll Ixalan. Look. Uh, uh, Throne standard. So we may want to like link a couple like in the description if we can find some. Like yeah. now they don't these are what you would use in a tournament, so they are a little pared down. You are limited to what you can like write on your sideboard guide. But yeah. they do show the like, you know, the hey, these four cards come in, these are the cards that come out, and every so often there would be some like notes that we would write. Mm-hmm. But like an actual like cyborg guide that would usually be like, you know, Here's what comes in. Here's what comes out. And then there might be like a paragraph about like how the Why matchup or... plays. Yeah. Yeah. How, how you need to like play differently versus a certain deck or. Yeah. And I'm sure we could find, we could probably link to an old article that's not currently behind a paywall. Yeah. Right. There might be some like star city content from like last standard. Yeah, maybe. So. And one of the complaints of content creators is like people just want the cyborg guide. And it's like, yeah, because that's where you get your edges. Right. Right. Everyone knows what the game one matchup plays like. Right. Right. It's how do I take my like bad game one matchup and turn it good in game two and game three? Or like, how do I take my good matchup and make it great? Yeah. Right. And that's, you know, where people, um, like, where the edges come. And so, yes, everyone wants that because the cyborg guide, that plan, oftentimes comes from just playing tons and tons and tons of games. Which a lot and, of people don't have time to do. Yeah, you just don't have time to do it. Right? So it's like, hey, can you please play all the games? I know you're playing them anyway. And just, like, tell me what you figured <laughs> out because, like, I have a job. Yeah. And and your job is to play magic games, which is pretty sweet. So could you please like hook me up? (laughs) So, yeah, yeah, but we can, we should be able to find one of our old ones to see like what you could take to a tournament. Yeah. Right. So I I just thought it was kind of, kind of crazy that that used to be just like public knowledge that people gave out when they were talking about a deck. And now it's, 
it's all hidden behind a paywall, like everywhere yeah. you go. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that, like, well, I mean, it used to be that you could, like, hide the whole deck, right? That whole, like, cool premium article behind yeah. a paywall. But now, like, it's people post so many deck lists, like, between, like, uh, top deck. Arena deck lists. Arena deck lists, top deck. Um, yeah. Goldfish. What is Goldfish. There's another, oh, gosh, Stream Decker. Yep. Right? Where you can just be like, oh, I saw a video of someone playing a deck on stream. And you can just like type in and like there's a deck list. Yeah. And you can export it right to Arena. Right? So like the deck list doesn't have value anymore. Yeah. What has value is the games that you played to figure out how to play it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it makes sense. But like we said, focus on what are your bad cards that need to leave. And then how are you planning to change how your deck plays in the matchup? Yeah. Right. That's and, the important stuff. Yeah. And just don't forget, like, your opponent is not a goldfish. They are also doing stuff. Yeah. Right. Are there any... Um... No, go ahead. Uh, your example of, like, oh, you could change your interaction, right? Maybe you know that your opponent is mono red and they... But their sideboard plan is always to bring in a five mana Chandra. Like that is what they've decided is like the value plan against your deck. Right. Yeah. It might feel really bad. Like uh, if you didn't know that, but you might bring in four negates. Yeah. Or pithing needle or. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, it's good. It's terrible against their like a plan. Right. But when they sideboard, their plan is to bring in Chandra's and, you know, an extra experimental frenzy. And you're like, yeah. well, I have to have ways to answer these. So you bring in the gates and like, well, they don't kill creatures, but they handle these other problems and they're going to have less creatures. So, right, knowing what your opponent does and then like adjusting to what, like, what they're going to do can go a long way. Yeah. Are there um, like any common pitfalls or like traps that you see like newer players making as far as sideboarding goes that we might be able to stop some people from making? Um, not sideboarding, I think is the <laughs> the is the big one, yeah. right? So there was briefly a series uh, meme or dream, yeah, where Saffron Olive would play bad decks or. Dex supposedly went five zero according to Wizards, right? And it would off in in like platinum or better, and it was like decks that like had no sideboard, and like just having like fifteen cards in your sideboard, yeah. will make your deck better if you use them. Correct. Right. Just like I don't know, a bunch of like O fours, right. They're not good cards, but they might be what you need against a uh, an aggro deck. And it's way better to have them than to not have them or to have the option. So yeah. just like making a sideboard and then like using it. And even if you're only doing like the level one of like, I know what they're doing. I need to bring in stuff to counter that. Or mm. I know that these cards aren't good. And I just need anything in my deck that isn't these cards. Yeah. Right? Your deck is going to get better. Like, turning a zero into a one is a huge improvement. Well, yeah. I mean, if you have, if there's cards in your deck that are just dead, like removal spells against a creature list deck, you, and you like draw your opening hand and you've got two removal spells in it, like you just mold the five. Yeah. But they could have been something with power and toughness, something that yeah. said draw a card, even a land. They could have been any number of things that weren't just nothing. Right. Yep. So I think that is the biggest thing. Even if you're sideboarding suboptimally, it's better than not sideboarding at all. That's true. Right. Um, one thing that like I know I had some issues with when I was kind of learning how to sideboard was 
not listening to all of the stuff we just said. And instead of playing cards that like changed the way my deck worked, I used to only play like silver bullets. Like mm-hmm. I need a card that hates artifacts and I need a card that hates graveyards and I need a card that hates counter spells and I need a card that hates lands. And that's how I built my sideboard instead of things like uh, collective brutality that like change the way the deck works a little bit. It gains you some life. It, you know, gets rid of a card in their hand. It might kill something like cards that change the way your work a lot or the way your deck works a lot of times are more useful to you than like a rest in peace would be something that's very specific and only hates on an archetype. Yeah. Um, Not saying that those things are like bad. They definitely have their place and they're worth including in your sideboards. But if all you have in your sideboard are 15 cards that hate three different things, you're going to have holes in your plan, I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah. Where you can, I think those cards are, are fine. But maybe you, I think those cards are good when you have a specific metagame in mind, Mm -hmm. right? You're like, oh, last week graveyard decks did really well. Yeah. So again, this is, this is old thinking from when there were weekly tournaments, but like last week graveyard decks were really popular. So, and they did really well. So more people are going to play graveyard decks this week than they would normally so I think I need to have a few slots dedicated to graveyard hate. Yeah. But you're like you said, your whole deck can't just be like, you know, four graveyard hate spells, four artifact hate spells, four yeah. land destruction spells, and then three removal spells. Like that doesn't work. Right. Right. You've got to have that balance of like, yes, I can set aside some cards to do like the graveyard hate thing, but I also mm-hmm. need cards that do other things. I can't just be like, there are four things I care about and that's it. Yeah. The like kind of goes hand in hand with that is sometimes it's important to diversify like what you're doing also to kind of cover other matchups. Like if you were playing a white deck and you had four rest in peace in your sideboard, like rest in peace is fine and it's a perfectly serviceable like graveyard hate card. But if maybe two of those were graph diggers cages, you could bring them in against the company decks. That way you have, you still have your four graveyard hate spells for the graveyard decks, but you also have something you can bring in against the collective company decks. Yeah. So yeah. diversification too. Yeah. Just uh, again, have that flexibility and not be locked in. All right, so we already touched on this a little bit, and that is net decking. Yeah. So we bring this up because, again, some of this stuff feels like we're, like, I don't know, in the 1940s. Back <laughs> so in, long ago, right? Back in my day, right? So there was a time when we would see other people, and we would play games of magic against them. Mm-hmm. And they would get mad because they had spent the week since the last F and M coming up with their own beautiful, perfect deck. Yeah. And you might have been like, Well, it's five o'clock, I need a deck. Let me look on the internet and find a deck. And yeah. the person who tuned their deck all week was like, You net decker, blah 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 blah. And like that's not cool. Like, just let people play magic how they're <laughs> going to play magic. Um, this is still relevant. I mean, it, there's people all over the internet that complain about net decking, mainly when it shows up in their, like, quote, casual cues or whatever. But, like, people still complain about net decking for sure. Yeah. I mean, yes, that is it is a thing. But, yeah. like, I just kind of feel like... We just have to let people play play the game. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, and I, I, think, I would much rather get a game than not, even if it's against a deck I'd rather not play against. Yeah, and I think that the the main knock for neck decking now is 
I think that we have to, like, realize that not everyone has, like, the time or the inclination to, like, tune a deck from nothing all week, right? Yeah. Or for for however long, right? I mean, it feels really good when you do that and the deck works out, right? Mm -hmm. My my blue-red deck that I missed day two with by by playing my worst matchup (laughs) back-to-back, right? But, like, that felt good. But at the same time, though, I think the biggest issue now is net decking leads to solve slash homogenous formats. Yeah. Right. I think that's the biggest knock. Not that like, oh, you're not like playing magic in the way it was intended where you like slave over your cards and figure something out. Mm -hmm. It's like just, oh, no, I'm playing. I'm playing the same deck over and over and over again. I guess this isn't fun. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest knock, but I yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I guess that's net decking, but that's more a function of like the way the game is now than actual net decking. I think. Yeah, I mean, I I am a dirty net decker, right? Like if I see a deck that oh, looks absolutely. interesting or fun, I'm like, sure, let's put that together. I still yeah. like have ideas, and I'm like, oh, I need to try that or whatever. But for the most part, it's like this deck is here. Someone made the mana work, or mm-hmm. at least work to a point where they were not weren't like bad at it. Yeah, like this should be fine. I'm going yeah. to play this. Cool. Yep. So, yeah, I think that we just need to like chill on that. Oh, so related to this, this is kind of tangential. Okay. Um, so about how like formats homogenize. Interesting thought. Maybe the arena economy leads to this. This isn't my thought. This was MTG Goldfish podcast, right? Okay. I mean, I could definitely see that. Rare and mythic wild cards are so precious. Yeah. That, like, you can't, like, brew a deck because you've got four mythic wild cards to spend. Are you Mm going to spend them on Ren and Seven? Right. Or are you going to spend them on, like, some, like, you know, Lisa sp- value engine or Zog deck. Yeah. And it's like, mm, no, I'm going to like spend it on the card that I know is going to be good for a longer time. Yeah. And now that you've done that, you are committed to playing Ren and seven decks. So it is now your job to find the best Ren and seven decks or only play Ren and seven decks from now on. I mean, it makes sense, right, especially so- when like you can't get any value back out of them. Yeah. yeah, so now you can't, like, move and, like, people aren't willing to just be like, I guess I'm going to spend $300 this set. Yeah. It's like, can't can't do that. So, like, that could also be another, uh, another thing. Mm-hmm. But I think net decking, again, 100% fine, right? And, again, like, I think when we did this topic a while back, right, we said, like, for the casual tryhard, like, it's the way to, like, get a deck that is, like, functional absolutely right like the the worst thing is to like come up with a deck and be like not realize you're two land short of your deck being good right like i was i have 100 percent been there yeah right and it's just like i should have just played like the net deck version of the deck so i would have been better since this is the second time you've kind of alluded to the same thing um I will say that even like even when I'm brewing decks and not straight net decking, a lot of times I'll find you know a deck that's has the same like color composition and rob the mana base from it, and then yeah. just build my my shell around the mana base because like that's one of the trickiest things to get right when you're brewing is what your mana needs to do between like comes into play tap lands and flip lands and untapped lands and conditionally untapped lands and snow lands and not snow lands. And like, there's, there's a lot that goes into building a proper mana base, like how many man lands you want, how many sources you can devote to like colorless utility lands. There's so much that goes into building a mana base. Normally that's my first step when I start brewing is to look up other decks that have like, If I'm building a Jund deck, I'll look up, you know, a mid-range Jund list and just take the mana base and delete the rest of the deck. And then that's where I'll start brewing from. But even if you're not like 
looking for a super complex like three color mana base even if you're just looking for like a mono black deck see how many man lands they're running see how many you know field of ruin or faceless haven or like how that breaks down is important and that's all stuff that you won't have to do when you brew your deck yeah gives you Um, more time to work on it there was uh and mtg was playing um a four color like control deck Mm -hmm. and i think he was like bant splashing red okay and there was another person who has been playing like for months bant splash black Mm -hmm. and he was like i have no idea how to build the mana base of my deck so i just took uh i forget the person's name but i just took their mana base and every black land became a red land yeah so like if they had an underground sea i made a volcanic island yeah (laughs) and that's how he built the mana base like he already did all the work right I know this mana base is good. I just have to make it match my colors. Mm -hmm. And he had a functional mana base and just didn't have to think about it. Yep. So yeah, definitely like let Frank Karsten do all the math for you. (laughs) Way easier that way. Way easier than like how we built decks like 20 years ago, which was like, I want two third spells, one third lands. We missed a lot of our third <laughs> land drops in sure like did. 1996. Yeah. So, all right. Next up, we wanted to talk briefly ish about the metagame in yeah. general and what like, kind of like a metagame what it is. is. Yeah. So, the metagame is kind of the game outside the game. It's the space that you're going to be playing in. So if you sign up for, you know, a standard challenge or if you're on Magic Online and you're going to go play in a league or at your FNM, the metagame is going to be like all of the other decks that you can reasonably be expected to play against. And like they kind of break down into buckets. So there's like the aggro decks and the mid-range decks and the control decks and there's kind of like a a hierarchy between them right yeah so like typically the mid-range decks are going to go a little bit bigger than the aggro decks and beat up on them a little bit and mm-hmm. then the control decks are going to go a little bit bigger than the mid-range decks and beat up on them a little bit but then it comes back to the beginning where the aggro decks are low to the ground enough where they can get underneath the control decks and beat up on them. So it's like a, I don't know, like a cycle or like a food chain, if you will, where, you know, what goes in must come out. Everything, everything has a good matchup and a bad matchup. Ideally. I mean, it's, like, it's not often, all metagames are perfect, but. It's often described as like rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. Right. Like where you like, you know, everything has a counter. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what has happened in recent meta games is the like there was like a fourth thing thrown in, which was like giant over the top ramp decks <laughs> yeah. and whatever flavor of. Yeah. And they basically made it so the mid range decks were too small. Yeah. And control decks always have problems with ramp decks because um, every threat that a ramp deck plays is is a must be answered threat. Yeah. And eventually, eventually the control run out of answers. Yeah, and eventually you run out of answers and then it's like, oh, now I'm like super far behind. Yeah. Because one thing snuck through. So that's like why Tron is not a good matchup for blue white control. Yeah. Because eventually some stupid seven to ten mana spell is going to resolve. Mm-hmm. And now you've got to deal with this giant thing that you couldn't stop from happening. Right. And then it snowballs from there. So when you have too much ramp stuff, I think this paradigm breaks. Mm-hmm. Right. Because our ramp, our ramp was also able to get big enough, fast enough that the aggro decks, either because they weren't aggro enough or because the ramp decks had enough interaction or life gain or life gain to keep them 
like at bay. Yeah. Right. Like they were too if, good at stabilizing. Yeah. If if like you're Sultai and you know that on turn four, a good percentage of the time you're going to be able to cast Shadows Verdict. Yeah. It kind of makes it hard for your opponent to go like one drop, two drop, two drop, one drop. And it's like, oh, when they untap, they're just going to get rid of all of my creatures. Right. My and I guess I lose. Away. Yeah. And I guess yeah. I lose. Oh, I can't. I either have to dead them this turn or I die. And so you like you just had this this weird thing for the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so. Like you said, aggro gets kind of brick walled by mid range. Mm hmm. Right, because where aggro is playing like a two mana, two two, mid range is with playing haste. A, yeah with haste. Mid range is playing a three mana three four. Right, right. <laughs> that eats your graveyard. That eats that has that, reach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or even thrashing brought to dawn. Right, just yeah. like big thing. Yeah. Right, and you know, like you're like, well, three four is not that big. It's big when the biggest thing in your deck is a three two. Yeah. Right. So, right, you got that, and then control, like you said, gets under. Like control's good at like setting up, and you can't let control set up shop, right, right. Which is like in sideboarding, right? Control will usually bring in way cheaper answers, mm-hmm. so that they have time to get to the I have set up shop phase of the game, or things that just buy time. Like yeah, that's. I mean, that's why I wanted to talk about the new timely reinforcements because that's. You know, typically a card that control uses to stabilize, gain some life, make some blockers, gives them time to set up shop. Yeah. Um, so mid range, like we said, mid range, good against aggro because it's mm-hmm. that, that one step bigger. Control is that one step bigger than aggro, right? I, I mean, sorry, then, then mid range. Then, then mid range. Yeah. Mid range oftentimes relies on creatures. Yeah. And control gets like card advantage from playing sweepers. So, yeah. right, if you're the mid range deck, you've got to play your three mana three four because that's how you're going to win the game. You mm-hmm. play your three drop, you play your four drop, and then they cast uh, a five mana wrath and they get two of your cards for one of theirs. Yep. Right. And then you've got to rebuild and then that gives them time to like draw their next answer. Or cast a draw spell to find their next answer or whatever. Yeah. And so that just, you end up being behind. Mm-hmm. Right. And then control, like we said, control is too slow for aggro when aggro is good. Right. And, just go underneath it and kill it before it gets set up. Yep. And mid range is too small for control. Yep. Right. So, and then like we said, there's the fourth one, which is ramp that is too big for mid range, too big for control. And in a perfect world, too slow to beat aggro. Right. And that's usually like the check. Yeah. Is hey, aggro like if we if if they my opponent plays mountain, I'm going to lose this game. Mhm. Right? If I'm the blue green ramp deck, but that has not been the case as of late. Yeah. There's also like another type that like a lot of times kind of sits over top of one of these other archetypes and that's combo. Oh, uh, yes. Combo kind of fits in between the spaces. There's aggro combo, mid-range combo, control combo, tempo yeah. combo. There's there are decks that are aggro or mid-range that just also happen to have a combo finish. Right. Right. And then there are decks that are like purely like I'm going to combo you out. Mm-hmm. And like they like combo decks oftentimes do pretty well against mid range decks game one. Yep. And and aggro decks game one. If the aggro deck gives them enough time. Right. Yeah. If your combo is fast enough. If you're playing against like a counter spell control deck, like oftentimes you don't have a good time as the <laughs> as the combo deck because they your deck is named something right your deck is yep. named ad nauseum 
So that means they know they can't let the spell ad nauseum resolve. Basically. And that makes your game much, much harder. Yeah. Because now you're like, I can never resolve the spell I need to resolve. Right. So like combo decks that also just like play like a reasonable fair game. Mm-hmm. Are like Splinter Twin. Splinter Twin. Like even like to some degree, like the Neo form combo deck from Historic, it could just dissolve into d- devolve into like bad beats. Yeah. Or like a Lauren, right? A Lauren is like a value creature deck. I mean, a Lauren's almost more a value creature deck than it is a combo deck. Yeah. That just happens to have a couple cards in it that let you combo off. Yeah. And like you're like winning the game by playing a bunch of two for ones. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you can just be like, oops, I guess I win the game for real now. Yeah. Right. So like you have this like, and the problem is, is like, we don't typically think about combo in the meta game. Yeah. Because like it does kind of sit off by itself yeah. and it's rarely uh, in. Uh, uh, what's it called? It's rarely in like a standard meta game. Yeah, especially, I I mean, this is going back to even before, like, fire design. They've kind of been designing combo out of standard. They haven't really, other than, I guess, uh, Sahili Cat. Like, and that was an accident. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Philodo Guardian Sahili, I mean, like, you could almost argue that, like, Fires of Invention was, like, a combo deck. Almost, but not yeah, really. not like I mean, you that, did a that thing was more and won of a the game. Deck than... Yeah, not you did a thing and you won the game. Yeah, but yeah, like we typically don't have combo now. Like Pioneer is just this wild and crazy like combo land <laughs> until they ban your combo. Then you got to play a different one. Yeah, and then they ban that one. I I just I just have like a pile of banned combo decks. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like you like playing combo. Yeah, and then they just take it away from me. But you can just, like, like combo, because it sits off in its own place, its matchups aren't always super clear. Yeah. Because, like, there can be combos that are good against control, right? Like, one Land of the... based combo. Yeah, I was going to say, one of the, the upsides of, like, depths is, like, in most matchups, there are only, like, six cards you have to worry about. Yeah. Like, once you make your 2020 you're worried about swords to plowshare and i guess now brazen borrower and that's it yeah right like all the other cool card advantage stuff that you did doesn't matter because i can yeah because i can make you dead in a turn yeah and so that is just a thing that you can uh not that is just a way that you can kind of like step outside of the paradigm yeah can you can still oko in legacy right no. The banned Oko and Legacy? Oko is banned in Legacy. Our blue green three mana uh, Simic Mythics were only down to Uro. Okay. So Uro is the only one. Oko is only playable in Vintage. Like, Oko has basically been scrubbed <laughs> from Magic. <laughs> Does not exist anymore. Yeah, like, he is, he is gone. Which is wild to think that the face card of a. Of a of a standard uh uh set not yeah. not but like a few but like two years ago is now like yeah the I'm on the scryful page the band and pioneer band and modern band and legacy band and brawl band and historic <laughs> it is legal in vintage and commander are the only yeah. two places you can play this card. And a uh, fun fact, um, a regular Oko is still $14. Oh. A full art Oko is $21. Jeez. Right, which is wild for a card that can't be played anywhere. <sighs> like, I have four Okos that need to go away because I am not going to be playing Vintage anytime soon. Yeah. 
right? Like it's just like, oh. I wonder how much of that is like price memory and how much is like actual play. Yeah, I don't know. Like how many people are like planeswalkers are usually bad in Commander. Yeah. But like I don't know. If you play an Oko and then just elk your opponent's commander, like isn't that <laughs> yeah, good? Yeah, I guess that's pretty good. <laughs> like that might just be great. Yeah. You're like, oh, I have an answer for all of your commanders. Elk. You get elk, an elk and elk. you get an elk and you get an elk. Everybody look under your seat. It's elks everywhere. <laughs> but before we started this game, I stuck an elk underneath your seat. <laughs> uh, you would now like to pull that elk out. And put it over your commander. Thank you very much. Right. I appreciate it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's kind of wild. Yeah. So, we had talked about Limited yesterday. Yeah. And, not, yes, not yesterday, uh, last week, just a little. And mm-hmm. I've played some more. And I just want to, we went into this, like you said, in the pre-show. But I just want to give you a heads up. You should play Swamps. Yeah, there's really no reason to play anything but Black. Yes. like Just force, like at this point, just force Black. And you might be saying, well, if everyone knows you should force Black, how can I force Black? There are enough cards. Yeah. Right? You can maybe And there's enough a- people that aren't also. Yeah. You might get a feeling like, oh, hey, maybe I should like abandon ship. But usually what ends up being right is to have like seven black cards Mm -hmm. and 16 of your other color. And that's probably still better than having no swamps in your deck. So like things like uh, Siege Zombie. Yep. Siege Zombie is great. Is right. It's the two mana two two that you like tap three other creatures to deal one damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a bunch of decay zombies in black. You just have a free ping or two every turn. Mm-hmm. And they runs you out of the game. Uh, Hobbling zombie is like a removal spell that also dies into a thing you can ping with your siege uh, zombie. Yep. Um, uh, dire graph. Oh, what is it called? I, I had it earlier. The the three four, diagraph horde diagraph horde, yeah right, the four and a black three four that makes two zombies and exiles two things out of their graveyard for some reason, like, because reasons. By far, like probably it is the probably the best black common. Like I'd probably take it over, eaten alive. I think I have, and. Right, just stabilizes the board, gives you fodder, right? Like, your opponent's at seven, you play that, and it's like, well, you've got to play a blocker or I'm going to kill you, right? Seven power for five mana, even if it's only, like, one swing, is kind of crazy. Yep. Considering there's a a green rare that's, like, a little bit more power, but costs one more mana. (laughs) Yeah. The, uh, like, all of the black removal is really yes. good also. Um, like, better than any other color. All of it. Yeah. Even, even the bad black removal is better than, like, any other color. <laughs> I mean, what is the bad black removal? Like... Um, the one that investigates... Is oh, foul play? Is dead. Yeah. But when it's not dead, it is, it, it's a beating. Like, your opponent does oh, yeah. that, and you're just like, oh, my God. Like, they just get your two drop, and you're like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. Um, But... Yeah, so like you have Infernal Grasp, but Uncommon, Defenestrate, uh, Olivia's, Olivia's Midnight Ambush. Yep. Um, and Eaten Alive. Yep. I'm missing one? I think that's all of them. Uh, uh, in Foul Play, right? In Foul Play, yep. So, um, like when you are playing, like be mindful of like what removal spell you use when right because it might make sense to let's say they play a two toughness creature Mm -hmm. right but it's on the ground and you have an olivia's midnight hunt and a defenestrate if they're a deck that's like blue white maybe you want to defenestrate this two toughness creature because you know they're going to play a flyer 
Right. And you need to like keep your Olivia's Midnight Hunt to pick off their flyer. Or mm-hmm. you're like, well, I'm going to use my hobbling zombie to neutralize this ground creature. And I'm going to keep my defenestrate for a bigger thing. Yep. And like, wait. But, you know, because there's been some times where I'm like, oh, I should have used my defenestrate earlier because now I'm stuck with it in my hand because I used another removal spell and I can't and deal with flyers. this flyer. Yeah. Yeah. So just be mindful of that. But yeah, so things Siege Zombling, Hobbly, Siege Zombling, Siege Zombling, <laughs> Siege Zombie, <laughs> uh, Hobbling Zombie, um, Diagraph Horde, all the removal spells. Um, the Arrogant Vampire is fine. It's not like at its best in like a lot of the zombie decks. Yeah. Right? Since so many of the white and black cards are focused on you sacrificing things, you want things that make extra bodies. Right. So hobbling zombie, even if you have to like sacrifice it, it gives you a zombie. It gives you a body to use for other things to sacrifice. Yeah, whatever later. else you're doing. Yeah. So you always are trying to look for those things that are going to give you multiple bodies. Mm-hmm. Right. The the best uh, uncommon in the set is Morbid Opportunist. Yeah, that thing's nuts, man. It is crazy, right? If you watch, it never and, doesn't get a card. It never doesn't, and yeah. that's what I was gonna say. Like, if you watch me play, you will see. Like, I will talk about like, all right, I don't want to play this until I can set up a situation where I play it and I get my card back immediately. Yeah. Right? It's like, well, you know, I could play my Morbid Opportunist or I could play my Hobbling Zombie on three. Well, I'm going to play Hobbling Zombie because if things work out, I can go Opportunist, sack the zombie, and kill your thing, or exile it with Eaten Alive, and get my card back. And like that... So even if they... Then they untap and they killed my and then they kill your opportunist. You get another card, right? Right. You've set up this thing where like you've just make, got a huge advantage over them. Yep. Um, it triggers off tokens too. So like your dead does, zombies work exactly. Like you're like, oh, I played a rotten reunion on turn two. I'm just gonna play my opportunist on three and attack because I don't have my fourth land drop. Yeah. And I can get. I might be able to draw into my land. Right, like that's that's great. Like I think I would take the opportunist over just about anything. Yeah. Um card's insane. Yeah. Like I have actively passed like good rares in other non black colors. Like basically <laughs> basically when I sit down to do a draft, it kind of sucks is I wanna be Esper. Yeah. I preferably black, white, or blue black. I don't know if I've been blue white yet, but I want to be like there because blue white is super grindy and you can kind of compete with like the black decks because they're killing your things one for one most of the time, mm. but your things are coming back. So you're getting ahead on cards that way because all your, all your creatures you can cast twice. Yeah. Right. But then they like, you know, diagraph horde and exile your two cards. And then you're like, okay, now I'm losing. This this was fun. <laughs> now now we are done because I have nothing to do now. Yeah, even right. like Rat and Reu- like you mentioned Rat and Reunion. Like that, yeah. the card in the deck is perfectly serviceable just for sacrifice fodder. And it also hates on everything Blue White's trying to do. Yeah. Like kind of incidentally. Yeah, and like it, again, it gives you bodies that you need. Another yeah. thing, I've not, the card is good. I've not been able to draft the deck that they kind of described on LR, but Ecstatic Awakener. Oh, the, no, I like that card. No, so so do I. But, like, they, they drafted, like, a deck with, like, five of them. Oh. And I feel like, so we talk about, we talked about in the pre-show that draft might be more difficult to self-correct because of, like, how things are done in arena but like i think that is part of the draft that has self-corrected 
those used to wheel. Yeah. And now they don't. You know what I mean? Like people are taking them much higher than they used to. Mm -hmm. It's probably because there's more people drafting black. (laughs) Just in general. Yeah. So like all of the black cards are getting taken regardless of what it is. Yeah. It's just like, oh, it's black. I need some. But like that card works really well with things like if you have like, say you have two or three of them. Right. Then thing like a uh, novice occultist. Right. Yeah. You sack your novice occultist to your thing and you draw two cards. Mm-hmm. Right. Novice occultist, while not great, is fine. Right. Like it kind of stonewalls some of the draws out of like green white. Yep. Where they're like they have two two mana three ones. Yeah. And you're like, cool. Block. Draw a card trade for your thing yeah like i win now right like the the game's over now like i just like yeah um so like it does have some like reasonable use cases out of side of just being like sack fodder Mm -hmm. right you know the the two one out of the whatever the the vampire that like pings when it attacks like you're perfectly happy trading for that you're just like cool done i i will make this trade every time yeah so uh, yeah, like I have drafted, I think I had said, let me look here. I have it up. I have drafted 19 times. I have not had swamps in my deck four times. One, two, three, four. I have drafted black 15 times. And Right now, my win rate sits at 58%, which is not, like, great. Like, I'm not trying to say I need to go in the Hall of Fame, but I'm winning more than I'm losing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it says something for sure. Yeah. That is meaningful data. And, like, there have been multiple times where I have started on not black. Yeah. And just been like, well, I can't pass this Defenestrate. Like, that's a good card. (laughs) <laughs> and then like get an eaten alive and i'm like uh, okay and then like for some reason like a six pick diagraph toward it's like fine i'm in you you did yeah. it you made me do it and then like i just get a good deck out of it and it's like okay like i didn't want to go here but i'm here now yeah so sometimes it's not that you're that i've forced it Sometimes it is just like it has fallen into my lap because like I look at the commons and I'm like, I would much rather have this common than any of the uncommons in this pack. Yeah. So, yeah. And like we and like I've not played uh, red green one time. I've not played werewolves once. But it's the werewolf set, Brian. Yeah. Yeah, uh, LR brought this up we talked about on the pre-show, but like, there's just incidental things that just hate on werewolves in yeah. the set, like to the point where it makes them bad. Right. So I don't want to rehash. I'll rehash all of it, but there's just a lot of times where it's like, why is this card here? It is too good against what should be the best set, right? Um, it'd be like if in Crimson Val, there's just like clove of garlic. <laughs> Clove of garlic, wooden stake, and sunlight. Yeah, and they just all like, in some way, kill a vampire. Yeah, and it's like, well, I guess I can't play vampires because you put three like main deckable, reasonable hate cards. Yeah, you know, sunlight is deal three damage to any creature or kill a vampire, and it's like, yeah. so I can play this in my deck, and it's not bad, but it also just annihilates the vampire decks. Yes. Cool. So if you're sitting down to draft and you're like, I don't know what to do, like black is the way to go. Now yeah, if just you black cards. Yeah. If you are right, if you're like, I want to do werewolves, you can try. Just know that You should have if, taken black cards. You should, I probably should have taken black cards. So I played a blue red spells deck, draft seventeen. I think I think this one goes up on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And um 
I was playing and I was like, why am I not playing swamps? Like every deck I played against was black and like every deck I felt like I was behind. Now, I don't think I had the best version of blue red spells. Like yeah. there are definitely some some picks I wish I could take back. But every single deck I was like, wow, this is so bad. And they'd like play like a diagraph for it. And I'm like, I could have had that card, in my deck. But here I, <laughs> here I am playing like, uh, oh, I, I, I'm playing the four, the five mana spells that makes a, uh, you know, makes a card based, makes a creature based on how many like spells are in my graveyard. Yeah. It's like, thankfully it counts spells in exile, but it's like, oh, they're just eating. I have no spells in my graveyard. This card doesn't do anything. And my opponent's just like, my five mana card does something every time. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> my oh. five mana card each eats that. Yeah. It's like, no. So I think that unless the format changes drastically, I think that people are going to get sick of it relatively quickly. Yeah. Right. Because it feels like you can support easily two black drafters and like some, yeah. And maybe someone splashing black Mm -hmm. and that's just going to lead to like every game you play or most of them are going to be against like swamp. Yeah. And the problem is, is like, the black decks are all kind of the same. Red black's different. Like red black is aggressive, mm-hmm. but like yeah, green... but I mean, even it is still trying to do basically the same things. Yeah, you're just putting pressure on instead of inevitability. Yeah, but like green black, blue black, and white black are all like slow, grindy value decks. Yeah, which I'm here for. Like that's what I like to do, but like. If every game turns into like the slow grindy mirror match, after a while you're just like, uh, like everything, everything's the same. Like if you eat ice cream for every meal, eventually you'll be like, no mas, no more ice cream, right? Yeah. And so it's like, oh hey, I'm playing all these great super grindy games, and then it's after a while it's like, great, all I play is these long grindy games. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. So, I mean, I was kind of for a one, one with haste. Yes. Yes. Though that stupid one, one that like gets first strike when it attacks. That card's great. That card has done substantially more work than its stats suggest. Yeah. The number of times where it's just like, I can't block this because because if I do, they're going to pay three mana and just eat my thing for free. But yep. I also can't not block this because it's going to deal me 12 damage. Yep. So what am I supposed to do? And it's usually die to it. <laughs> but yeah. it's like, ugh. Like every time someone plays this, I'm like, okay, this shouldn't be that good. And it's like, I can't block it with my two drop. Can't block it with my three <laughs> drop. Can't block it with my four drop. Okay. Because it's like organ hoarder. And it's like, get a card. They're like, cool. Attack kill your organ hoarder if you block you're just like eat your organ hoarder <sighs> all right cool eventually you get to your diagraph hoard and you're like yay i can block it finally <laughs> and it's like yeah you needed your five drop to block it great yeah yeah but unless they also have their five drop that kills yours uh, yeah that they deal five and then deal you five or deal you two yeah yeah and exile it yeah it, and the number of times we're like playing the format a lot where I'm like, I have blockers. And then I'm like, no, I don't. Those are decay zombies. <laughs> they don't block very well. They yeah. just fall apart. The There's also like, there is this like weird like thing that happens where over and over and over again, your opponent just taps their zombies to do a thing. Yeah. And you forget they have the ability to attack. Right. And then you find yourself at eight and you're like, oh. I guess I'm dead now. Six decayed zombies. Yeah, I guess I'm dead now. Like, I have two blockers. Oops. It, like, sneaks up on you. And you're just like, oh, no. What what, what happened? So I'm hoping the format gets a little more diverse. But, like, it has been enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But if anything, I would say, like, be black and then find your other color. Usually white or blue. Yeah. And, right, like, if you, like, fall into, like, green-black 
because you get like a couple of the four three grizzly bear. That thing's pretty good, especially with the decayed zombies. Yeah, yeah, no, I I agree. But like you know, if you fall into that deck, like mm-hmm. that's fine. Yep. But for the most part, be that uh, that reanimate spell's pretty good too. Yeah, so that's when I realized that my uh, my artisan deck was gone because I played like green black reanimate mm-hmm. with uh like all the cycling creatures and i was like oh this will oh. be this will be great in that and then yeah. i was like oh i can't i can play it for historic artisan but <laughs> that's that's not the same no nope. it's not the same so like i'm gonna miss you titan off rex <laughs> we had such good times space godzilla yeah uh, Space Godzilla was in there too, and yep. Greater Sandworm. But it's yep. like, oh, my opponent's playing cycling and has a bunch of one ones. I'm gonna reanimate a life linking trampling eleven eleven. <laughs> I guess I win now. This is great. Can't be blocked by creatures of power two or less. Yes, <gasps> it has life link. Good yep. luck. Yep. So, all right, with all of this, our little foray into Take Swamp. Uh, of limited i think we have a show yeah i think we have a show so if there's anything you want us to talk about magic related you can uh reach out to us on twitter at casual tripod yeah i think this is pretty much going to wrap up the learn to play series um at some point we'll revisit the one section that we skipped and we'll talk about why we skipped it at that point but like i said i think this is going to wrap up that series so if there's anything that's you know, burning questions you guys had or topics that you had that you're kind of waiting for a time to shine. Now is the time to shine. Um, like Brian said, you can hit us up on Twitter. You can hit us up on Facebook at casual tryhard MTG, or you can drop us an email show at casual tryhard MTG.com. You can use our discord. There's a link in the description. There's a link on all our social media, uh, hop in there, have a chat with us. Let us know what you think about the limited, environment right now or if there's any sweet new brews you're playing with or if you got a question about you know magic cards in general or this set in particular or if you want us to look at a deck or whatever you want uh post up in there let us know also uh don't forget if you're looking to buy any single cards from this set please use our tcg player affiliate link we'll really appreciate it uh tcg.casualtryhardmtg.com Uh, Everything you purchase after following that link will get a small cutoff to help keep the show alive. If you would like to support us a little bit more directly, hop on over to patreon.com slash casual tryhard MTG. Throw a couple bucks in the pot. You get access to our pre-show. You get access to our show notes. And every once in a while, I throw a give back in the mail and give you something cool for his little token of our appreciation. And uh, I think the next give backs are going to be really cool. So maybe hop in there and, Get on my mailing list. That's what I was going to say. I've seen the preview for the next one, and the next one is really neat. It is a fun piece of magic history. It is, yeah. It'll be cool. I'm excited for him. Yeah. So with that, we'll catch you on the internets? Yeah, we'll catch you on the internets. I I think I've given up on (laughs) FNM. Oh, no. (laughs) 